The Center for Educational Media and the College of Education at Middle Tennessee State University are proud to offer professional development to K-12 educators in Tennessee through our online video library. These videos are aligned with standards set by the Tennessee Department of Education. For more professional development videos, check out our website at cem.mtsu.edu. Okay, we're going to begin our last session. Um, how wonderful to have Dr. Uh, Cardenas Hagen here. There are nearly 5 million English language learners in our U.S. public schools, and nationally about 1 in 10 of our students are learning to read and spell English. Some of you are in schools with a higher population than that, for sure. Um, Dr. Cardenas Hagen is a bilingual speech language pathologist, a certified academic language therapist, a certified dyslexia therapist, and a qualified instructor. She's the president of Valley Speech Language and Learning Center and an associate research professor for the Texas Institute for Measurement Evaluation and Statistics at the University of Houston. Her research interests include the development of early reading assessments for Spanish-speaking students, in addition to the development of reading interventions for bilingual students. She's authored curricular programs, book chapters, and journal articles related to language and literacy development for English language learners. Dr. Cardenas Hagen is currently engaged in a national project for response to intervention, MTSS, among English learners, which is sponsored by the Office of Special Education Programs. She currently serves as the vice chairperson of the International Dyslexia Association and chairperson of the National Joint Committee on Learning Disabilities. Please join me in a warm welcome for Dr. Cardenas Hagen. Thank you. Thank you for having me here today. And um, I can't say they saved the best for last because I adore uh, Marsha Henry. Thank you. Let's give Marsha Henry a round of applause. And um, what many of you don't know is Suzanne Carricker was my teacher. And I would fly to Houston every Tuesday to take uh, classes to become a dyslexia therapist. <clears throat> but often those classes began at 8 in the morning. And I would fly from my hometown. Um, the flight would be like at 6 in the morning. So I'd get to the Houston airport at 7 and could, you know, get in the taxi to get to the Nyhouse Education Center by 8. And um, this past week, I was uh, in, well, just yesterday, I was in Baltimore, and one of uh, my colleagues said, oh, thank God I'm not in an airplane with you, because there's always something going on. So Suzanne Carriker, I didn't know, her daughter, her name is Elsa. And I would say, please, may I speak with Dr. Suzanne Carriker? This is an emergency. Or may I speak with, yeah, Ms. Carriker, it's an emergency. It's, tell her it's Elsa. And Suzanne would get the phone, what's up? You know, what's wrong? What is my nose? I'm like, no, no, I'm running a little bit late. There's fog in Houston. So they sent us to Dallas. And I will be there as soon as I can, because I don't want to miss a single um, opportunity. And so it's been such a joy uh, to know for many years Marsha Henry and uh, to know Suzanne Carricker as my, uh, also my friend and mentor. So you all have had a great treat today and so um, this e this evening it's already evening no you know this is in my culture this is our siesta time <laughs> and uh, I usually take a nap at this time but <laughs> I hope I don't think I'll take a nap today because I'm rather cold like you right it's a little chilly but um, I studied in Spain and when I came back to the States and I was trying to take classes. I mean, I would sit in front, try and stay awake, and I remember one day it was the chemistry professor, he just got up there and just blew up a balloon in front of me, and I said, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to fall asleep, but your, your clock is just used to, like, taking this nap in the afternoon. So uh, when I get the students, I'm like, oh, uh, yeah, hello, hello, no, just kidding. I'm always paying attention. But anyway, so I'm delighted to be here and to talk to you about a very, important topic. How many of you have English learners? I was just asking, like, are there any English learners in Tennessee? <laughs> Let me see your hands. Oh, all right, that's good. So you have a little bit of interest in the topic. 
<clears throat> so our, uh, my work and our work uh, with the University of Houston uh, <clears throat> with our team of risk researchers has been on Spanish-speaking English learners. How many of you have Spanish-speaking English learners? Okay, that's good. Now, we know that there are many different languages spoken in the schools, right? Uh, we have these English learners and the numbers continue to increase. Okay, you mean this whole time? Oh, okay, let me start all over. <laughs> Oh, just kidding. Um, so anyway, the English learners that we have, uh, and where's that clicker thingy? Oh, here it is. All right. So these English learners that we have in the United States, the majority of them do speak Spanish. And now these new numbers have uh, just uh, come out, and it's about 70 7% now are speaking Spanish as the most common native language. Now, we see that Arabic and Chinese are the next most common languages, representing you know, about 2.3% for Arabic and 2.2% for Chinese. But that doesn't take care of all the English learners that we have in the United States, because the home languages of these English learners represent 400 different languages. And in Houston, where Suzanne Kerker knows Houston so well, <clears throat> it's one of the most diverse uh, cities. And in that school district there, you know, have hundreds of you know, languages of these students, right? And so <clears throat> when we look at how many teachers have certification and training and working with English learners, it's less than 2% of our teachers with that endorsement for working with English language learners, right? Fast growing population and not enough of us, right, to work with them. So, you know, these opportunities mean so much. So I'd like to thank you for um, inviting us uh, to, or inviting me and uh, <clears throat> Marsha and Suzanne to speak here because, you know, what a delight to, to know that, you know, you can reach all of these people and that uh, making sure that we're also thinking about children who are English learners and um, children who also can struggle uh, with the English language and struggle with reading. So we know it's a fast growing uh, population and we know that uh, we need to do better. We know they need to do better, but really I say we need to do better too, right? It's not all on the child. And a lot of times it's like, it's their fault, it's their fault, it's their fault. But what are we doing to make the situation uh, much better, right? And <clears throat> I will tell you, um, uh, I know from experience, see, I'm so old that, you know, Suzanne was asking me, she goes, Elsa, did you have those, uh, you know, uh, uh, books, those Dick and Jane books? I'm like, yes, I did. And what was even worse is I didn't speak English. <laughs> and so I was like, Deke and Jamie, right? And so I had, we didn't, I didn't speak English. And, um, you know, so English is my second language, too. And when we went to school, there was no such thing as, you know, dual language or bilingual education. And, <clears throat> and we would get punished and spanked for speaking our home language at the school. And, <clears throat> and I knew that I didn't want to get in trouble, so I better not speak another one of those words in that language and <clears throat> you know maybe tried to deny that I even spoke that language because I didn't want to be in trouble. And <clears throat> really I was telling my kids about that and my kids go, Mom, that still happens today. We were told not to speak Spanish in the recess room and not to, you know, when we were, I mean, in recess, during recess and not when we were in the lunch room and <clears throat> still kids today. And really being multilingual, um, it's really, in my life, been an asset, really. Uh, and so we have to start thinking about it from <clears throat> what resources do these children bring and what resources can we depend upon? And that's what I hope to get the message today, <clears throat> that we've heard a lot about morphology, right? And <clears throat> we saw, you know, both Marsha and Suzanne show us that about 55% and in some papers, I see it's up to 60% comes from Latin. 
And <clears throat> you know, these words that are Latin words are often words that are high level vocabulary words, usually words with you know, very lengthy syllables <clears throat> and common everyday words in, in English um, I mean, in our language of Spanish are very high level words um, in English and talking about that morphology, <clears throat> I know that, you know, I always felt like this, uh, struggling to catch up in an English language uh, and taking that SAT test, which has a lot of vocabulary words, right? And <clears throat> then lo and behold, you know, in, in college, learned a lot about morphology. And you know what class I took? I thought this is going to be a class that, that's just gonna be an elective. It's gonna be so much fun, it's gonna be easy, and I'm just gonna take it for an easy A. And the class was <clears throat> Greek and Latin Roots for Medical Terminology. <laughs> yeah. And it was taught at the University of Texas, the other UT, uh, the University of Texas in Austin. And it was Professor Daly. And I remember Professor Daly, and I'm a speech language pathologist, and so was studying about speech and the sounds of the language. And <clears throat> Professor Daly had like a accent, and you talked a little bit about dialect this morning. And so it sounded like he was from the Bronx, frankly. And so I asked him, are you like from the New York area of the Bronx? He goes, no. I'm not, I'm from the Midwest, but my speech therapist was from the Bronx, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh my goodness. And Professor Daly is still there. And whenever I get to Austin, I try and go back and tell him, thank you, Professor. Thank you for your course on Greek and Latin for medical terminology, because then I took that test, the GRE, woohoo, and then I aced it for that language section for the first time in my life, because now I knew all about words, right? And all about morphology, and all about the words that I know that help me for reading, for writing, for spelling, right? And so this morning, you saw that history of the English language, taking just this beautiful story, right? And you saw this afternoon about the beauty of using morphology for spelling. And so this afternoon, what I want to show you and demonstrate to you is why we think the way we do, right? And tell you that we're not so messed up in the head, but we're actually using some of our knowledge from our first language for this development of English language, English reading, English spelling, English uh, writing. And so as we look at this, it's a frightening, it's kind of bleak. And, uh, we see that from the nation's report card, right, the National Assessment of Educational uh, Progress, we see here that if you're an English learner, you're way behind the monolingual English speakers. And guess what? We don't have enough of the monolingual English speakers on proficient level either, right? We're struggling uh, in this country. But we see that we have a 21-point deficit uh, when we're compared to monolinguals, right, uh, in eighth grade, and a 24-point discrepancy for English learners in the fourth grade when compared to the monolingual English-speaking peers. And then we have a double whammy. If we live in poverty, right, and we see now one in five children living in poverty, that that would be a 30-point discrepancy, right? And so <clears throat> where I live along the Texas-Mexico border, right, in the poorest county for a mid-sized city of the whole United States, right, <clears throat> so 100% free and reduced lunch in our school districts. We feed them breakfast and lunch, and they stay after school and work so they can get dinner, right? They stay after school for tutoring to get another meal in there, and we're open in the summers, right, so that they can have nutrition, the basic needs. The only way out of that cycle of poverty is education. And we depend on you to do the work for children who struggle, for children who may be English learners, for children who might have dyslexia and other reading and disabilities or writing disabilities or math disabilities. And so 
you know, these kinds of opportunities, we find out, do people read our papers? No. Where do people learn about what to do? Through conferences. There's been a market study done. <clears throat> I was on the board of the Regional Educational Laboratory for the Southwest, and it was found. Where you're gonna get your message is in opportunities for professional development and conferences like the one that you have today. That's how we're gonna get our message out. And plus, our papers take years and years and years to get published, frankly. And by the time they get published, it's like, okay, we're on to something new and different, right? So now you heard today about, we we're talking about spelling. But what I want, and, but in that spelling process, we have to know that we have to have good listening, and I say good speaking, to have good reading and writing, right? And so I've got to make sure that my students, my English learners, are actually taking in these words, these sounds that you are speaking, right? And I have to produce them, my teacher has to produce them with precision, so you better watch how you, what is your teaching language, your teaching voice. You see, we need a little bit of extra time to process, was that a word? Let me see, where did that word begin? Where did it end? It just sounds like gibberish when you speak very quickly. The voice and the rate that I use right now with you is my teaching rate. And that's something we have to be mindful of as we work with these students, especially students who are English learners, or frankly, students who might have other issues, such as auditory processing of language issues. So as we speak, we want to make sure that you don't let your students leave without being able to have precision right, in their production, because how we process it, say it, how it'll be how, and will affect how we read and write it, right? Uh, and so that, that's very important. We know that spelling, you heard about spelling today, as being not equal to reading, right? Dr. Suzanne Carriker explained to you how like, ooh, it's a higher level skill. Be just because you can read doesn't mean that you can spell. And so we know that it, we know successful reading and writing for good spellers, you know, we're probably gonna be good readers. And you might see those readers who have poor spelling, but it's rare that you will see a speller who can't read, right? And so spelling is like, a, we see it as a very high level skill. And we think about all the things, uh, okay, here comes the teacher, she's gonna say the word, and I gotta get ready, and I'm gonna write it down as quickly as I can. So the teacher's gonna say that word, and I have to listen to that word, right? And I have to think about, hmm, what sounds did I uh, process? Maybe I say that word to myself to help me process the word a little better, right? I'm gonna determine those sounds that belong within that word. I have to put into my memory, right, the sequence of those sounds. And I have to think about, hmm, today you learned about the best bet spellings that Dr. Carriker spoke of. Okay, what was, it? okay, mm, it's that in that beginning, so it's what's next to it, and what's the best bet spelling for that sound in this position, right? Or maybe uh, I have to think about the rules, right? Whether I'm gonna double or drop or change, right? And I have to do this rather quickly because I need to also write them down because the teacher right after that will be what? Telling me the next word, right? And uh, sometimes, and not as often as in the past, but we think I would look at those spelling lists that teachers give and I'm like, oh my God, why did they give these words? Because it would be like Dr. Carriker said, okay, let's memorize them, take that test on Friday, but then they're gone by Monday. So we want them to make sense and to internalize them and have lots of opportunities to learn, to learn those patterns, to learn those rules. Uh, and, but we have to make sure that our English learners can process those sounds, right? Um, and so we know that in reading, we decode the words and we go from what we see, those symbols, and we move that to the sounds. 
<clears throat> and then when we spell, we're going from processing those sounds and translating those to the symbols, all right? And so today we know and we talked about who are those good spellers? Oh, those good spellers have great awareness of the sounds, right? They can recognize and see those patterns and learn those patterns well. They have good, and this is where my English learners, I want to teach you about those auditory discrimination skills. And today, Dr. Carricker showed you about how to use the cognates. And I'm going to show you, uh, take it another step and show you which ones really apply um, to making connections across languages from these, what we call the minimal pairs or the cognates. Very important to see why they're making the mistakes that they do and what we can do about them. Um, but we know spellers are great at the sequencing. They've mastered the alphabetic principle. This morning, uh, Dr. Marsha Henry talked to you about everything to know about this. I was taking notes of like, I didn't know that. I'm going to read that book, and I'm going to read this, because we want to know more and more about this English language and its morphology. But I was so excited to see, you know, really reflected those uh, Latin uh, word parts, but also looking at the Greek and seeing, oh, this is how we handle the Greek in our home language. Um, Dr. Carricker talked to you about having that good orthographic memory. I think about those spelling bee champs. I'm a, I'm a nerd. I'm a spelling nerd. I watch the spelling bee, right? And I love when they're in there, but think about what they ask. They say, can you say the word again? They're get, taking a little bit of time to process. Um, can you tell me the word origin? What is that telling them? Today you learned about the word origin. You learn about the spelling of certain sounds from those word origin knowledge. Can you tell me the part of speech? Can you use it in a sentence? And what we see there is those little spelling bee champs are going through that developmental progression of spelling and how we get to these high levels of spelling. And they are fantastic. The other part about the spelling bee that I like is to see the winners. And recently, they had some winners that they tied, right? And there was, you know, that had rarely ever happened in the past. And they're invited on Jimmy Kimmel Live. How many of you watched Jimmy Kimmel? And so Jimmy Kimmel, Guillermo dresses up as a bumblebee, and he comes out and he pronounces the word it's all incorrectly. He probably said, like Suzanne Carricker would have said, colonel, or what was it? What was your dog's name? Colonel. And do you know that those spelling bee champs say, can you repeat the word? Can you tell me the origin? Can you do it? And use it in a sentence. And through that, they would get it right, and they beat Jimmy Kimmel, right? Even though Guillermo pronounced it all incorrectly, right? So we know that these good spellers are awesome at what? They're awesome at the phonology, the sounds. They're awesome at those, that orthography, those spelling patterns, right? Uh, and they're, they really have knowledge. When you add that morphology to it, so today you learned about the patterns, the rules. You learned about what to do about it. You learned about the morphology. So all of that is what we know about good spellers. <laughs> and what do we see teachers do? Sometimes we say, OK, let's, um, let me give you those spelling words, right? And let's practice writing those words, right? Let's really try and memorize them. How about if we write a sentence? Maybe that will help in the spelling. Um, you know, let me give you some homework practice, right? Uh, and then let's give you a practice test on Thursday, and then we'll have that test on Friday. And what we know is that that's not the best practice for spelling instruction, right? This, just a little bit ago, you saw good practice for spelling instruction, really having them think about the words, look at those patterns within the words, figure out the best spelling, apply morphology and the origin of the language to it, follow that pattern. That's going to help our students um, to do well in this classroom. So spelling is not remor memorization, that rote memorization. So I want to talk to you about this language uh, of Spanish as an example. 
And so when we think about the sounds or language uh, of, of the language, when I think about Spanish, we say, you know what? We have five vowel sounds, that's it. And those vowel sounds never change. Can you all turn to your partner and say, ah? Turn to your partner, say ah. Say eh. eh. Say e. e. O. o. U. U. That's it. Five vowel sounds, they never change. All right? Isn't that easy? In English, when talking about number of words, that million or more words, Marsha Henry, Suzanne Kierker, in our language, we have 100,000 words. So we go round and round when we try and explain things because we don't have enough words to get at the beautiful words of the English language. Now let's look at the letters and the sounds, all right? So I want to just show you, we have 17 consonant phonemes, all right? So we have five vowel phonemes and 17 consonant phonemes, all right? And in English, we say we have about 44 phonemes. Some might say 45, you know, just depends who, uh, who you're talking to. And so when we look at that, we have to know those letter and sound correspondences. But look at what we already have. Look at the resource uh, that we have. So let's look at some of these consonant sounds. So um, the letter B, can you tell me the sound for that in English? It's the same sound in Spanish. The letter C, uh, can you give me your hard C in um, English? K, very good. Can you give me your soft C in English? We have the same thing in Spanish, all right? Uh, the letter D, can you say the sound? The letter F, same. The letter G, give me the sound. And what, we, what do we say about K? It really doesn't exist in our language, but we do have words that made it into our language, right? So say the sound K for the K, right? And then we have the L says the M, N, the P, the S, the T. Now here's this letter V, and all right? And so we're trying to get rid of some, these dialectical variations, right? So the standard would be V, right? If you look at the history of the language in Spanish, right? And in English, it's also what? But in some dialects, they will say B for V, right? So that's why they say my mommy, took me in the mini band for my violin lesson and I had a betty betty good time, right? And so, um, so we see that they confuse the B for the V depending what region or what country they came from. Most Spanish speaking countries will do the sound V and they're so different, right? So do the sound B, what did you use? Your two lips. Now do the sound V, what did you use? So different. But because they use those two, they're using their knowledge, right, of how they produce it in that language, all right? So let's do the W. Can you do that sound for me? Okay, it's not W. Because <laughs> uh, um, our president, first president, wasn't W. Washington, and I didn't go eat at W. Andes, right? So I W. Ish, you wouldn't say W, right? Because the sound is actually, we don't release it until the next vowel sound comes. So it's W, right? So wish, Washington, Wendy's. That is wonderful. Turn and tell your neighbor the sound that you're never going to mess up again. Turn and tell your neighbor. That's right. Now, some will say, some will tell you that we don't have that in our language. But I'm here to tell you that we do have the sound. All right, so we will find that in our language whenever we have something like a U-E or a U-A. So say, tell me what you heard. I'm going to give you a word, you tell me the sounds. Cuento, say it. Cuento. Let's see what sounds did you hear. K E, N, T. Say, cuando. So there it is, right? So we do have that sound. We just don't spell it with W. Now, there are some words spelled with the W, but they're proper nouns, usually, or words that come into the language from another. Very few. Now, the X. In English, how do you pronounce X? Tell me your pronunciations. Say it again. 
it has kind of like the K with the S. X, that's the most common. What's another way if we saw X? It might say, not as common, but might say what? Z, yeah. So for us, X also says X, right? So if I say saxophono, that's like saxophone. It says X. And I might say that word xylophone, but I might say xylophonos. So, and we have one more, and that would be So we have three different sounds, but the ones that connect are the most common one of English, X, right? And then we have that Y, tell me your sound. And it's not Y, right? Let's try and clip it a little bit better. Y, yeah. that's right. And so we have that same sound. So if I looked right here, can you count up how many of those consonants were the same? How many consonants did you count? You can't count? <laughs> About how many? 16. 16, right. And the vowel sounds that are pretty close there would be the sound e. Eh. Can you say that? That's pretty close. E. Eh. Very good. And, um, but that's about it for those, like, that would go with the short vowel sound, right? Uh, that's about it. So you all have A E I O U, right? Uh, so those are going to be the challenge, you know, lots of challenges for our uh, students. Now, we also have the spelling patterns like you, and I already mentioned one spelling pattern. You learned it just a bit ago, that letter C, when it's followed by what letters? Tell me. A, O, U, and consonants. We have the same pattern. And, <clears throat> how, and then... Um, when C is before E or I, how do you pronounce that now? S, right? So that's that soft C before E or I in our language. But for you, it's also before the letter Y, like in cycle, right? Now, so do I have to know the language to make the connections? You don't maybe speak proficient uh, Spanish, but I have just shown you about the language, about the sounds, so that we can see and determine why are the children making those types of errors in their reading and in their writing, frankly, and what can we do about it? What kind of connections can we make to help them learn it better, right? And so we are going to make connections, right? I can learn, I taught, Suzanne Carricker taught us, you know, in a very, um, you know, kind of multi-sensory, systematic, explicit manner, a lot of the patterns and the rules. And can we extend that by making the connections? Look, you know this because it's also in your home language, right? Uh, and then the morphology, the same thing. You saw how much of the English language comes from Latin. Can we use that also uh, for our uh, knowledge of spelling and vocabulary? Uh, Shane, Templeton, and Morris said, spelling is a linguistic and conceptual process which involves knowledge of the alphabet, the syllables, and word meanings. Spelling tells us about a, what a student knows about words. And today you got to see, this morning you saw about hmm, the linguistics, about uh, those letters, about looking at syllables and syllable types for uh, the spelling, about using morphology for that word uh, meaning. And so if we do this kind of instruction for our English learners, they also will learn, but we want to make connections. Now, I'm going to teach you something about the stages of spelling development, and we have some little extra stages of spelling development for the English language learners, all right? And so in one of our studies, um, we had 50,000 kids in this study, and they were in Texas, and we were actually developing an early, early reading assessments in Spanish and in uh, English. And we were looking at the spelling patterns. And so if we look at some of the spelling patterns that we've learned about, like what, what are the early stages? You know, they start writing what we call maybe that invented spelling where it's like, oh, you know, here they're, um, 
we'll hear the first the pre community could say, well, oh, the letters, they're going to be used. I already, I'm watching my little four-year-old grandson right now. He's like, look, you know, this is A, right? And it says Andrew. And he's getting all excited about looking at those letters, and he's starting to recognize letters. And then just about uh, yesterday, my daughter-in-law sent me, she goes, look, he was trying to write cactus, right? And he had the C, an A, and a T, and an S for cactus. I was like, wow, I wonder what made him think about cactus, I don't know. But he was trying to write the word cactus. Uh, and so what we see is how wonderful that they're beginning to have that knowledge of the letters and sounds, and they're sounding it out, and there's a little neighbor uh, child that she lives across the street, and he's four and she's three. And she wasn't saying cat correctly. She would say cat. And he would say, no, no, no. It is cat. Cat. Say it, Gracie. And she would go, cat. And he goes, no, cat. And Gracie goes, cat, cat. And, he, and she, then she goes, meow. <laughs> she just told him, meow. But he was trying to teach her, right? And then um, <laughs> when my mom says, oh, go get that dog, Boney. And he says, no, it's not Boney. The dog's name is Bonnie, Bonnie, right? And so he's picking up on the sounds, on the pronunciation of those sounds, and really trying to get at that. And so he's starting to apply those sounds and that knowledge now to that writing. But what we find with the English learners, if we look at the English learners, we see they make the same types of errors as English, monolingual English speakers will, where maybe, um, so if we see, oh, right here, um, you see over here where it says drink, right? That sounds, you know, pretty fanatic, right? And that's stamp, but I didn't really process that. Mm -hmm. But look over here at the transitional uh, stage. Here's elephant, right? But look at united. That's using your knowledge about the patterns. They've seen that word you, and they use united. So it's kind of like this overgeneralization. So I want to talk to you about the English learners, the Spanish-speaking English learners that we know of today. And what I want to tell you is that we see an extra step for them. So before they get to this overgeneralization of English patterns, right? English, they go through the overgeneralization from the native language to the second language. And it's not a disability. It appears to be a pattern that we see very regularly. So they're going to use their knowledge from their native language and what they know from that native language, and they're going to overgeneralize it to English. Then you'll see them do the overgeneralization of that English pattern, like in United, to English. So the extra stage is that native language to English, and then the overgeneralization of the English pattern to English. It wasn't quite the right pattern. And then they'll move to that conventional spelling. Turn and tell your neighbor what I'm trying to explain to you. What is different? about the English language learner and that spelling development. Turn and talk to your neighbor about that. Good job. So now we're going to analyze and we're going to be looking at these patterns, right? These spellings. And I want, we're gonna see if what the, these spelling errors, we're gonna look at them and we're gonna determine, did this student give us a complete representation of that word. And does that student have the phonological knowledge, right? Uh, do they have that morphology? Do they have that orthographic pattern knowledge? And we're gonna look at, for monolingual and as well as English learners, right? Bilingual children, all right? So um, we could also see if the student has the representation, so in other words, they were able to completely represent it with symbols, but they didn't have the patterns, like you learned some of the orthographic patterns from uh, Dr. Carriker uh, this afternoon. Or is it just a partial representation? Something's still missing, they weren't, it was not complete. 
in their representation of the word, at least in that phonological representation. All right? So turn to your neighbor uh, and tell your neighbor this uh, is uh, elephant. Elephant. So turn to your neighbor and talk to your neighbor. Is that a complete representation? Is it a partial representation or is it complete with the orthographic pattern? And this would be for monolingual students. How many say complete? Is that complete? Complete with the orthographic pattern? Let's see. So we have this complete, but I want to tell you, why did I say complete? Look at that letter L, right? What might they be saying? L, a, fent. What, why the E? Because of the? That's right, elephant. So my bilingual children, we see this, we can see this pattern uh, similar to the monolingual. Uh, this is the word train, train. Train. What would you say? Is that, would you say that's complete? Train. How do we process that? Some of our kids will process it, it, process it as train, right? We don't say train. We're, we, what do we do with our language, right? Our bilingual kids will hear it as train. So what do we do about that? What's the plan? What would we do? What was that? That's right. So we are trying to get them to spell. So you know the, that's difficult, that T and the R. So terrain, terrain, terrain. Mm -hmm. Very good. What about, this is the word read. What did they do? They're using a spelling pattern, and, that, and actually that E consonant E would be a, one of our best bet spelling patterns, right? So I would say, good for you, but this time it's R-E-A-D. And so that is complete with the best bet orthographic pattern that we know for the English language but it was not the case for this word, read. All right, now, here's my bilingual students. That first word is meal, meal, meal. Like this afternoon from 11.30 to 12.30, we had a delicious meal. Is that, turn and tell your partner if that's complete uh, or partial? It's partial. What's missing? Ooh. Why did they use the I? Do you know? They use the I because in Spanish, the I says E, right? So in Spanish, that would be meal, and they probably didn't hear the last part, meal, right? So what are we going to do about that? Once again, work on maybe taking it apart, giving like you saw with maybe with the blocks, first with the sounds, then with the letters, right? Teaching them how we're um, saying it, right? And giving them a representation. What about you? What would that be? That would be complete. In Spanish, uh, and we see this mistake in my bi bi bilingual kids and monolingual kids. That Y, U, U, right? U, the kids make that mistake, b bilingual kids do as well as monolingual. This would be C, and once again, what do I have there? That E, right, it's represented, and my best bet spelling you know, would be E, E, right? That digraph E, E, but I use the I because of my uh, language. Here's name. That would be complete because E, I in our language says A, right? 
And so they don't know that A consonant E for name, but in Spanish that would make sense because EI says A. Here's another issue that told, that would be partial because what's missing? The L, told, right? And we also actually see monolingual kids have the same types of uh, difficulties. All right, so just like you saw for the monolinguals, right, it really is helpful for us as English learners to make sure that we're processing those new sounds and manipulating it. And as Dr. Henry talked about this morning, we won't see that manipulation of the deletion and those consonant clusters until about first grade, right? Um, we want to make sure they get those letter and sound correspondences, right? We want to make sure that they have those spelling patterns and that best bet, plus also those spelling rules. And we want to make sure they can really link to the morphology, the morphological patterns, like that extra letter S there, meaning more than one. So what are we going to do different for our English learners? Well, we're going to address the cross-linguistic transfer between languages such as Spanish, the most common language of our English learners. In Spanish, typically the words more than likely are regular because it's a very, what we call a transparent language, one-to-one -one letter and sound mapping. However, did you know even in our language we have multiple spellings of sounds and patterns just like you do in the English language, right? And so knowing about those patterns and knowing about how they connect will make a great, great impact on these students that are learning English as their second language. All right, so let's take a look at those. Here are some of the spelling patterns that transfer. You saw earlier this afternoon that letter C before A, O, U, and consonants. We have the very same pattern in our language. I might say casa, cosa, cubo, clavo. And you might say cat, cop, cut, clue. We have that C before E or I, not before Y. But you have E, I, and Y. So what's different there? The Y. We don't have that in our language, but it is that soft C. We have the same rule with the letter G, that hard G. So how are we going to spell it? G? It'll say, G will say G before what letters? A, O, U, and consonants. We have the very same rule in our language, right? G before A, O, U, and consonants. G changes in English when it's followed by what? E or I or Y. So words like gem, right? And gin and gym and giant. That's right. Now, in Spanish, we have the same thing, but not for the letter Y again. So I'm, but the sound in Spanish is not j. We don't have that sound. Our sound, right, is kh, so kind of that back sound, kh, gemelos, gitana. So we have G before E or I, except we don't say J. But we do have the pattern, and we do consider it that soft G, just like you do. How many of you knew about this pattern? Anybody? Oh, there is a few of you. Good job. All right. Now, uh, let's look at the multiple spellings. So we say Spanish is transparent, right? Uh, but here are our multiple spellings. Look at this. How transparent is it really? So if I say the sound s in Spanish, I have four letters that can represent that sound s. It can be the letter s, like in sol, which means sun, right? It can be the letter c before e or i, like in cena, right? It can be the letter z. Right? Because we don't say z, right? Our z, like in zoológico, the zoo, is the soft sound. S. And then that letter x, like in xilófono. So how many letters was that? Four. Our letter, our, our sound y has two letters, the y and the double l. So when you see them use double l for the y, this is y. It's the same sound. 
And when I hear the sound in Spanish of k, I can use the letter C, just like you do, the K, just like you do, but we can also use the letter Q. Did you know the letter Q in Spanish is also followed by the letter U? But we say k, and what do you say? Q. All right, very good. Now, here's this letter, and that X doesn't represent um, k, so maybe make a note on that in your handouts. That X represents this sound. Can you all do this one for me? Turn and tell your neighbor. Give him a face. That's right. So what letters represent in our language? It would be the letters J, G, and X. Like in even the word Mexico. And X is in proper nouns. Mexico, Oaxaca, Javier, right? Jimena. You saw earlier, I just want to show you, earlier Dr. Carricker showed you about that sound, oi, right? And she said, what did she say? When do we spell it with O-I? What positions? Typically initial and medial, right? But then she said, be careful about the, what? The syllable like in royal, right? And O-Y would be where? Typically in the? final position, right? So in Spanish, we have the same thing, right? So that O-I, right, oigo, right? But that O-Y, estoy, voy. So we have that in the final position. So we have that sound, oi, but, and we do spell it with O-I and O-Y, just like you do. So these are some more connections to be made. Now let's look at, um, multiple sounds of English, uh-huh. So uh, I don't know, like you didn't teach them about that doubling the S. So do you n not consider that, um, what was that? You didn't have time, okay, I was wondering about that. So that sound, we can use S, right? If it's after E or I or Y, we can use that C. And then when we have those one syllable words, say grass, right? What do you have at the end? Double S. Do you know why you double it? How many, if I say grass, how many syllables does that have? It has one syllable, right? And um, what kind of a vowel is that? A short or long vowel? And what's the final sound? S uh, say the word whiff that ha ends in what letters? Double F, because how many syllables does it have? One. What's the vowel sound? Short, and we double that F. And let's say fall, or let's say fell, fell. He fell, so that would have double L. It's a one syllable word after the short vowel. So in scientific spelling, Dr. Carricker calls that the Floss rule, right? So final F, L, and S is spelled F, F, L, L, S, S if it's a one syllable word after that short vowel. And floss is an easy way for them to remember it because it has F, L, and S. So we double F, F, L, L, S, S in a one syllable word after that short vowel. So that'll be something uh, for these uh, students to learn. Now, our best bet spelling, right? If I'm going to do E, my best bet spelling is probably like E-E -E or E, consonant E, or E in the open syllable like they were showing you. We have that OI. So the spell, how many patterns is it? Like more than like 250 patterns probably if I had to think about all the sounds. But we can teach this to our students and our English learners will really need to learn about these spelling patterns uh, in the English language. All right, so let's talk about some of the new sounds of the English language, and let's look at those syllable patterns, and let's look at the morphology, all right? So everyone say the sound shh for me. Shh, that will be a new sound. Now, um, one of the reasons I became a speech pathologist is because my father would say, I'm gonna sit on the chair, and I would say, no, daddy, it's chair, chair, ch 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 I would kind of do like little Andrew does to his little friend across the street. So why do they do shh? Do you know? Well, 
they try to get, it's like an, uh, trying to get an approximate, something that's close, but it really isn't, it's cognate, right? But we do say the sh for ch, because it's something that maybe we don't process it quite right, or we're trying to make the approximate, because really, we do have the sound ch in our language. We can say ch, we do have that sound, so it doesn't make sense why we say sh for ch, when we have ch in our language, right? So it's an approximate, right, that they try and get at. Now, the mm, can you say that? Mm. We don't have mm in our language. However, even Spanish speakers don't know you really do have it, guys. So in English, say the word bank. Say the word sink. What did you hear before that k sound? Say sink. Say it again. Sink. Say bank. Bank. What are you saying? You're saying nk. So whenever we have N before C in Spanish, we also say nk. Say banco. Cinco. What did you hear? Nk. There it is. And all, even Spanish speakers don't know that. But I tell them, yes, we have it. We say nk just like they do in the English language. So we do have n. Mm. Now say zh, right? We don't have that. And so what were some of the words that you heard that have that zh pattern from this afternoon? Words that end in what? What, what do we have? Like, like S-U-R-E, treasure, measure, pleasure, and? S-I-O-N, like when it ends in a vowel, like explosion, right? Conclusion, right? So say zh. That will be very problematic for your English learners. Now, this T-H, um, you saw that there was two T-H sounds. So let's do the one that has voicing. Put your tongue between your teeth and say v. All right. We have that in our language, but no one knows it except me, because I'm a little freak. But here, let me tell So show me your fingers. Put your finger, put one finger in the air. All right. Who knows the word for finger in Spanish? All right. Dedo. Everyone say it. Dedo. We spell it D-E-D-O. Did you know those two Ds have two different sounds? The first D sounds like the English D. Say the first syllable, de. Now say, do. De, do. When, when the letter D in Spanish is between two vowels, it says, v, like in English. So when my Spanish speakers are, sp are writing the word father, and they're using the letter D, it's not because they heard you say fodder. It's because in Spanish, we use that medial D for TH, voiced. Turn and tell your neighbor, what letter is it in Spanish that represents TH voiced in English? Turn and tell your neighbor. What are the two sounds of D in Spanish? The first one's like English, it says D, and the second one is V, all right? So even your Spanish speakers don't know that, all right? So I promise you. So the D, the medial D between two vowels is your English TH. All right, now, say the sound and they're gonna tell you, we don't have H in our language. H is silent, but we do have that sound. It's similar. We do have something similar, right? Something similar, close and approximate. We say it's a little bit further back, right? But very similar, if we could just move it a little bit more forward and not so like guttural, we can say instead of right? So we have that H, right? And then that letter J. Now, if I have CH in my language, just like Suzanne Carricker showed you today, so say ch, ch, ch. Say the sound three times. Touch your vocal cords, say it. Ch, ch, ch. I have that in my language. Don't ask me why I can't say the J in English. If I can say CH in Spanish, 
I could say J in English. And we have trouble, trouble, trouble with that, right? We say yellow for jello, right? So let me have you turn on your voice box like Dr. Carricker showed you. Say, let's say it without our voice box on. Say ch, ch, ch. Now turn it on real hard. J, j, j. Turn it off. Ch, ch, ch. Turn it on. J, j, j. Turn it off. Ch, ch, ch. Turn it on. J. Our English learners need that practice and that letter J that says J or the D G E or the G E G I G Y, that's problematic for us. But if we can say C H and Ch, then we can do J. And that's how you would teach it to your English learners so then they can hear it, see it, say it, write it, right? Okay, very good. Now, let's uh, look at, oh, the Z, same thing, all right? I, I always say, um, I want those ones. And I went to the Sioux, right? Instead of the zoo. But if I can say s, I can say z, put your, and I tell them, put your teeth together, everyone. Teeth together and say z. Now voice box off, s, voice box on, z. And I know a lot of times we want to say it Incorrectly, I'm going to the Esu or Esu. And why do we say Esu or Esu? We say the E eh because we don't have, you know, it's very hard for us. We, lots of things start with the S, 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 right? And it's hard for us not to put that extra vowel E in front, right? And uh, even when it's the sound, so I, some students say, I'm gonna, eat spaghetti, right? And I'm gonna drink a Sprite with my spaghetti, right? And so I tell them, do not open your mouth. Show me your teeth, spaghetti, right? Sprite. <laughs> All right, now, so here's the minimal pairs, just like we saw Dr. Carricker give us, this very helpful for our students. Say the sound s, that's voiceless. Give me the voice partner. Very good. Say ch. Uh, can you clip it? Ch. All right, now give me the clip sound. Voiced, j. Say it again, j. Very helpful for our English learners. Say the sound, t. Now turn on your voice box, d. Very good. Um, say the sound, sh. Now turn on your voice box, j. Very good. Say the sound, oh, b, b. Now give it to me voiceless. Very good. So I just want to show you something here. Going back, all of the what's new for our students on these minimal pairs? So on the minimal pairs, what's new is the sound z, right? So that's different. What's new for the English learner, Spanish speaking, is j. So this is it, you know, not in this, uh, gonna have that in Spanish. But we do have this in Spanish, the t and the d, but not that medial th, right? And we don't have this one in Spanish, the sh or the zh with that zh sound, right? Be quite challenging. And that b and the p we do have. So that's a complete transfer that we can make connections across the two languages, all right? So we learned about also those six syllable types. So say the word men, say hip, say not, say end. What do they end in? What kind of a sound? A consonant sounds. And when you produce your consonant sounds, typically your mouth is like blocked by your articulators, blocked by, by your tongue, your teeth, or your lips. So we call that a closed syllable. Why do English learners need to know that? Because we don't know when to say the short vowels or the long vowels. And can I tell you, in our ESL classes, they don't teach us this. And we need to know this. And so we don't, you know, typically they just want us to memorize the words. But we need to know the differences. And just like Dr. Henry showed you, the differences between like me and men, very helpful. Because when it's ending in a vowel, you, what happens to your mouth for the vowels? Your vow, vowels open the mouth. So we call that an open syllable. And with that syllable ending in a vowel, it makes the sound long. 
And now I know not to say in my language, me, he, na. I know to say me, hi, no. And I can contrast that with like men, him, not. So having that practice as an English learner helped me compare that closed syllable with that open syllable so that I know the two types of vowels that you have, short vowels and long vowels, right? That is a very helpful task. And then we see here, you know what I want to say here? Name, teme, five, rope, cube. Because we have that, we have those patterns in our language, right? But we pronounce those vowels. They're not silent like they are in English, but we can learn them. A, E, I, O, U, right? Vowel, a consonant, and that final silent E. So that we don't say that we need to learn that pattern. And then let's look at, say, star, her, sir, world, and fur. What do we know there? It has a vowel with an R. And most of the times it's going to say what? Er. But, um, but let's, look at, let's look at the word star, right? And I think Dr. Carricker told you that R typically would be a R, right? But now I, I say, uh, some of my friends say, do you have a dollar, right? And I'm like, no, it's dollar. So when that AR is not accented, like in dollar, that's when we say er. And we need to know that as English learners, because we don't know when to say R for AR and when to say er. But if you teach me, ah, you put more, when it doesn't have that emphasis, when you're not accenting, it's stressing it, then you'll say er, right? The same thing with OR, say corn. That's, that OR is accented, right? Now say doctor, tutor, right? So I want to say tutor, tutor, doctor. So as an English learner, we think it's always going to be or. But you need to teach us that when it's stressed, it's O-R, or. When it's unstressed, you're going to say er, right? And the spelling, but we have to learn that spelling, right, uh, for the O-R. And then that W messes us up. <laughs> so when that W occurs before that O-R, can you say worth and world? What sound do you hear for the O-R now? Yeah, so you're going to need to explicit me, explicitly teach me kind of like, oh, look, when that W before, most times it's going to say that er. That would be very helpful, all right? And then here come your vowel pairs. Oh, my gosh. All right, you have a lot of these, so I'm going to need to learn each and every one of these very explicitly. And then there, there was that rule. When two vowels go walking, the first one does the talking. It's not such a good rule. It doesn't apply enough, right? And so you're going to need to teach me. I need to know oo versus uh, right? And when we say oo, like say the word moon, that O-O, -O, that's my, in Spanish, my U, all right? Unico. So when I say, in Spanish, the letter U is your O-O, -O, U. Uh, so that's going to be, I'm going to want to use my letter U for that instead of your O-O, -O, all right? So we have boat and tow and sail and pie. You're going to have to teach me those, and then we're going to analyze them as uh, we're having to spell and read and write them. And then we had those final stable syllables with the L-E, candle, sample, ankle, uncle, puzzle, right? And once again, those are the final stable syllables. We learn those as these patterns, and then we learn how to spell them, right? But if I give you an activity that would be helpful for me was when you give me words and I have to spell them. And sometimes the words you give me, I don't think they always follow the patterns. But one of the things I can do is do like Dr. Henry say. I'm going to give you, for example, if I give you, um, if I give you a word like plain, P-L-A-N-E, what kind of a syllable would that be? What's the syllable type for plain? A consonant E, right? So a vowel consonant E. So that would be a vowel consonant E syllable. So I often help my English learners by not only processing the sounds, seeing that pattern, but also looking at the syllables and the syllable types to know when to say which vowel sound. Very helpful for our English learner. 
All right. So, um, so that really helps. And knowing about these syllable types, like those open and closed syllables, can help this speller, this English learner, know whether to double, like you learned today with Dr. Carricker, that you know that medial uh, consonant, right? Uh, like, oh, well, I don't know if you did rabbit. You didn't do that one, right? So, um, whether to double the consonant or not, right? Knowing about that, so. Let's look at uh, the morphemes. So this morning I heard um, uh, Dr. Henry talk about these morphemes and talk about the Latin and the Greek, right? Lots of morphemes. And then we uh, talked about these, um, looking at these word parts, right? And thinking about the word origins to help us with spelling. So I want to um, look at, so in this word dog, right? Uh, we have how many morphemes? How many meaning units in dog? One. How many in the word missing? The same concept translates to Spanish. If I say the word gato, that is a cat. But if I say transportación, if you just looked at that word and you knew English, how many morphemes would you say? That's the word what? If you looked at that, that would be transportation. How many morphemes do you see? Some of you are saying three, some of you are saying four. It is three, right? Ah, tricked you, tricked you. All right, so now let's look at, now we're gonna look at some error patterns, all right? So in, for this morphological language, what do I have to do for my English learners? You have to teach me, just like Dr. Henry told you, you have to teach me, um, I know that O-R, or, that's it, like professor, I have that. But you have to teach me about that E-R, right? Because I'm gonna use O-R. Um, I know that in the suffix O-R and E-R can mean one who, but it's only in Spanish that O-R meaning one who, right? Uh, we know that those old English words are common everyday words. Dr. Carricker told you they were farmers and hunters and fishermen, and so these are words that we use in our language. And we know that Latin words are very sophisticated. We use a word facilidad, that would be in, in our language, that's us saying easy, con facilidad, right? With facility, right? Um, or aplacar. We use that every day to say calm down. You would use the word placate. Common everyday words in our language are high level English words, right? That we use every single day. And so, Finding those connections. We have a website called Colorin Colorado, Colorin Colorado, right? And we have list of cognates on there to teach about, look, these are the same, but look at the level of the word much, much higher, right? Uh, and so we use Latin examples, professor, right? Director, but those are also cognates. So there's a lot of words that are similar across the two languages, all right? Uh, so English words of Greek origin we learned today will spell the self as what? P-H. Greek words are long scientific words, right? We learned that that sound is spelled C-H as in the word chemistry. And we learned words of that French origin that ch will sound like what? Sh. And but in Spanish or Latin-based words, that sh is going to be with letters like ci, si, ti, right? And those come that are Latin-based, and that's going to help our Spanish-speaking English learners because that's what we know, right? We know the letter q is followed by u. We have that in English, but we also have it in Spanish. But our sounds are different, right? Yours is k, yours is qu, ours is k. English words don't end in the letter V. We typically don't have that in Spanish. We, what was your, your cheer from Dr. Carricker? Let's see if you remember it about the seven brave letters. Tell it to me. H. Never double in real English words, right? So we don't double those either. <laughs> All right. And English words don't typically end with the letter I. What do we use? Y. 
But Spanish words, guess what? We end in the letter I. So we're going to see the students do that. All right. So now here's your assignment. This says, it was a stormy day. Take out your spelling rubric that you have in front of you that Dr. Carricker gave you. Find your spelling rubric. All right. And this is an English learner. And he writes, uh, it was a stormy day. All right. So um, I think I did mine just to, like this. She kind of like did a little bit. All right. So it was a stormy day. Decide what that's going to be with your neighbor. And let me just read it to you, and you're going to work with your neighbor for a few minutes, and we'll do it. The little girl's name is Sandy. The tree is on fire, and the man has a hose to put the fire out, this is an English learner, because the house could burn and there's a storm heading to the town. People are going to their home because the children could get sick. All right, work with a partner, and let's decide zero, one, two, three, four, five, and then we're going to decide what to do about this. All right, I'll give you a few minutes. Let's look at the first one. Say stormy. What did you put that as? What would you put that as? A three, woohoo! What does this student need to know? What does this student need to know? They need to give me the rule. English words don't end in I, they end in very good, very good. Um, the little girl name is Sandy. And I didn't count that. Sandy, because sometimes people might spell it that way, even though we don't we say English words don't end in I, but here's someone's name that does possibly. But what about little? What would you say there? You would say so maybe a three. What's just missing there? The pattern of Yeah. So teach the doubling of the medial consonant, right? And teach the final stable syllable pattern. That would be two things that you could do to help the students. All right, the tree is on fire and, what would that be? That E-N for and, what would you put? A zero. What is this student missing here? This is how they're processing it as N. So what do they need to do? Know the difference between what sounds on the vowel? E and A. Let me hear you do the E. E. Now, A. And I teach my, oh, my English learners, I, I teach them to do this. A. So that they'll get that A. So they go around going A. OK, now take away the arms, right? So we know that. And then what about the ending? D. Say and, so I'd get my blocks out and do my sounds. I'd make sure that they see the sounds, hear the sounds, can do the sounds. All right, the man has a hose. Huh, what would you say there? You put a zero? But I said there was only, what's just missing there? The s, right? So maybe, a, I gave him a little bit more credit. I put a two, right? To put the fire out. Now, I want to tell you something. AI in our language says I. So AI and AY in Spanish is the English sound I. So what are they doing? They're overgeneralizing from Spanish to English. So they are representing all the sounds there, right, in their language, fire, right? But I have to teach them that I consonant E, fire. So AI, they used what? Knowledge of their language. AI says I. All right, what about this next one? Because. 
you gave it a three. B, what are they using in their language? The I says E, right? Cuz. And they might not hear, do you say B, cuz? Because final, sometimes fi that final Z can be in an S, right? The house, what did you put for house? What did you put? A three. Okay, good, because um, AU in Spanish says ow. Did you know that? Say ow. All right, so that would be house. Once again, what are they doing here? This student is overgeneralizing from Spanish to English. All right, the next one is could. What's missing there? What am I missing there? The L, could, right? And the D, could, or maybe just that D and T. Burn and theirs instead of what? There is. Now, let's look at this one. A storm heading. I put that one as a two. What did you put? Once again, what did that T and that D, right? To the town. What did you put? Three. What about people? Three, just like we did little. Look at the patterns. Little and people are. What do you see there instead of are? You see or instead of are. Two. Going to their. Three. Home. Whoops, three, and then because, I mean, you might want to, I, I was talking to Suzanne Carricker about this. She goes, oh, kind of between a two and a three, depending if you give them credit for that final S is uh, the Z. The children could, that would be a two, get sick. All right, now I want you to turn to your neighbor, and I want you to think about, look at your rubric again. Let's look at the rubric. And I want you to think about what Dr. Carricker said, right? saying the zero would be what? Working on what? What did she say zero was for? Working on the sequencing of the sounds, right? The one to do would be that auditory discrimination practice. The three, a lack of knowledge about the patterns, and the four, that overgeneralization of the patterns between three and four. Tell me, go, turn to your partner and talk about, to your partner, what would your instruction, we've got to be diagnostic and prescriptive. What would you do for instruction to be diagnostic and prescriptive? What would you do for this student? What are some of the things this student is missing and what would you do about it? Turn and talk to your partner and then we'll discuss. I'll give you just a few minutes. All right, so give me an idea. What would, uh, uh, any syllable patterns that are needed there? Any syllable patterns? If we, uh, if we looked at our six syllable types, is there something you would work with this student on uh, regarding the syllable types? Final stable syllables, obviously, when we see what, were the, what gave you the hints to that? Little, people, very good. What other syllable type? If I look over here, home, maybe the vowel consonant E, right? What kind of auditory discrimination practice does this student need? Where am I seeing an auditory discrimination trouble? Auditory discrimination, like two, remember the two sounds that are similar? The T and the D, right? Between the T and the D, that's right. Um, what about vowel sounds? Which ones do they need help on? The E and the I, right, very good. And the A and the E, very good. What about, um, what about uh, looking at words like could and would and should? What do we have at the ending of those? L, D, that would be very helpful. Very good. Anything else? Fire, remember that vowel consonant E, just like that O consonant E, I need that I consonant E on that final stable syllable. Very good. 
All right, so we know that we can look at this and use the rubric that you have in front of you to also look at English learners. We can look at the auditory discrimination practice. We can look at the syllable types. We can look at the spelling patterns, and we can also teach them to learn the spelling rules. But do we always need a test to determine that? We can get samples from their writing to determine what kind of errors do they make, but we have to understand that oftentimes they're using their language for that second language, and that's not something, it's a disability or disorder, right? It's a part of learning that second language, uh, you know, literacy, that second language spelling ability. So I hope today that you've been able to make some connections and learn about, oh, this is why these are the types of errors that we see and what can we uh, do about it. So as children learn to spell, their knowledge of words improve and it also reinforces their reading. Thank you very much for sticking it out towards the end of the day. Have a good afternoon.